Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Siddharth Zarabi and joining me today is a very special guest, one of India's most influential policy makers, P. Chidambaram, who served as the finance minister of the country for over three terms, presenting uh, nine budgets uh, record, uh, uh, which, which is yet to be beaten. Mr. Chidambaram's latest book uh, out in the market very shortly, and he's joining me for a conversation uh, on on what is the situation of the economy. Mr. Chidambaram, thank you so much for sparing time for this conversation. Let me begin by asking you about, uh, about what has been said by the economic survey, sir, uh, that India is a, a, a sort of a spot of stability in a very uncertain, unusual external environment, global gloom. Um, uh, is India indeed in a safe spot, Mr. Chidambaram? Well, I think the economic survey bases its conclusion on one number, namely that our GDP growth is likely to be, say, 7.4% or 7.6% in the current year. But except that one number, every other number is pointing to the other direction. So what kind of stability is this if rural wages are not growing, if there is rural distress, if firm sales are down 6%, if manufacturing sector sales are down 11%, if credit is growing at the slowest rate in 20 years, that's not a stable economy. It's more or less a, a stagnant economy. And I don't think we should be carried away by one number. The number looks good. Maybe it is good. But that one number doesn't capture the economy. Mr. Chidambaram, there are people who have even questioned the quality of that number uh, 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 in the sense that they are not very sure towards its composition and the manner in which some changes were made. Uh, do you agree with that view or is that just an overstatement? See, I am not a qualified statistician and therefore I am not competent to question that number. But I can tell you why that number is being questioned. How does that number arrived? That number is arrived by taking the nominal growth rate, which is about 8.6%, on which there is almost complete consensus, and using a deflator of 1. Now, I'm told we have not used a deflator as low as 1 for 30 or 40 years. If a normal deflator of 2 or 2.5 is used, growth would be much lower. So the RBI seems to have questioned the deflator. Several economists have questioned the deflator. Equally, in all fairness, I must say, other economists have supported the deflator. But it's for statisticians and experts to sit together and answer the question whether the correct deflator has been used to arrive at real GDP growth. Absolutely, and that's a question that um, keeps getting put to the, uh, to the uh, concerned officials. But uh, since you spoke about the RBI, one of the points that we have noticed is the RBI talking about uh, the, uh, you know, the fiscal situation and warning that any relaxations or slippages would be very bad. You yourself have uh, recently commented about uh, that to saying that it would be a terrible mistake. Yet, Mr. Chidambaram, the government and many people, uh, in fact, there is a newspaper article quoting unnamed finance minister officials disagreeing with what Mr. Rajan seems to have said, saying that, you know, uh, why is he giving us advice? Because we don't tell him how to uh, run his monetary policy. In, in, in this kind of a mix and in the tenuous situation that we are in, what is the right policy as far as the fiscal needs uh, are concerned and the growth needs are concerned, sir? I have no doubt in my mind that the government must stick to the fiscal consolidation path. In fact, they modified it last year. If they had adhered to the original path laid out in the Vijay Kelkar plan, they should have had 3% as a target in 2016-17. Now, I think they will achieve the target of 3.9, the relaxed target of 3.9 for 2015-16, but the whole world will be looking to what is the target that they are setting for 2016-17. They must lower it to at least 3.5%. If they don't, I'm afraid 
they will be making a terrible mistake. But how can I prevent government from making a mistake? Uh, well, that, that, that's absolutely right. But what would be the right thing to do, Mr. Chidamnam? I'm not asking you to advise the government, but uh, 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 of someone of your stature, how would you balance this situation? Because clearly, like you uh, said, there everything other than a number is going down, and therefore there is a need to provide some sort of boost for growth. Uh, is a growth uh, package required at this point of time? See, the best signal you can give to investors and analysts around the world is to stick to the fiscal consolidation path. They should announce that in 2016-17, our target is 3.5, and in 2017-18, we will reach the ultimate destination of 3%. That's the best signal. Now, to revive the economy, you require many, many more measures. The fiscal deficit target alone will not revive the economy. You'll have to do many, many more things, uh, structural reforms, uh, stalled and stranded projects must be revived. There must be better implementation of projects. A whole host of activities have to be undertaken. And I'm sure their intentions are, are good, but I think there is a huge gap between intention and implementation. How serious is the situation as far as stuck projects is, uh, are concerned? Because there has been a lot of talk and attempts, but nothing seems to be uh, uh, moving really. And on top of that, you have you have a, a NPA situation which has become the biggest worry uh, as far as the overall economy is concerned. I think it's quite uh, serious. That is why the UPA appointed the project monitoring group. And the record will show that a large number of projects, something like um, 6 lakh crore worth of projects, were indeed uh, revived. But after that, I think the leadership of the PMG has become weak. We don't hear much about the PMG anymore, nor do we hear about how many projects have been revived every week or every month. So I think uh, it's important to have on a long-term basis, a fairly empowered mechanism to revive stalled and stranded projects. That's very, very important. See, businessmen I speak to say, I ask them, why are you not investing? The answer is, our existing investment is stalled or stranded. How can we invest more? And it is a stalled and stranded projects which have contributed heavily to the NPA situation. The NPA situation is a direct consequence of stalled and stranded projects. Therefore, I think the two are linked. And if you want to deal with the NPA situation, while you must do many other things, you must ensure that stalled and stranded projects are revived. Mr. Chidambaram, when you look back at your tenure um, uh, with regard to uh, the, the banking situation now, uh, I, I'm asking you this honestly. Do you sort of look back and feel that some warning signals as far as uh, the bank situation were missed, that the kind of lending that was going on was not appropriate. Do you, have you ever had occasion to sort of look back on that, sir? See, the government is not the regulator of banks. It's the RBI which is the regulator of banks. The government is only the owner of the majority shares of the bank. We review the banks. We review their performance along with the RBI rep, the, usually the deputy governor, and we caution the banks that the NPA situation should not be allowed to deteriorate. In fact, I laid down the rule. For every rupee of loan that is ultimately written off, not a technical write-off, but ultimately written off, you must recover one rupee in the same financial year. Suppose a bank wants to write off at the end of the year, 500 crore rupees worth of loans. It should have recovered 500 crore rupees from other NPAs. That rule was pretty much strictly enforced during my tenure. But the regulator is the RBI. Now, whether RBI's regulation was more lax, whether it should have been tighter, well, that's for the RBI to answer. But clearly, 
there has been some regulatory laxity. But don't uh, put all NPAs into one basket. I think NPAs are inevitable in an economic downturn. And the world went into an economic downturn since 2008. There was a pause for about a year or so. But again, the downturn uh, accelerated. Barring three or four countries, virtually every significant economy is in recession today. That means our export demand is affected. That means uh, we, we don't have the kind of markets that we had, which is why the volume of exports and the value of exports is negative. For 14 months, we have had negative exports. In such a situation, NPAs are inevitable. But the NPAs must be divided into two categories. NPAs caused by willful defaulters and NPAs attributed to victims of an economic downturn. I think in the first case, willful defaulters, the government has indeed deal with them with a firm hand. But in the case of victims of an economic downturn, I believe government must lend a helping hand until the economic downturn uh, turns uh, northward. Uh, it, the economy picks up again. I also believe, and I've said this on more than one occasion, the overwhelming number of micro, small, and medium enterprises are not willful defaulters. And even among the big defaulters, many defaults occur because of stalled and stranded projects. I'm going to ask you one quick uh, last question on this very matter. You said several things in that answer. One, you spoke about the laxity of the RBI. Uh, the other bit that uh, is also coming up on, in the overall situation is, is the court sort of getting into this act and, and this threat that, you know, publish uh, every name, uh, the bit of judicial activism in a, in, a, in a matter which you have so clearly defined and put in three different silos. Um, uh, a public debate uh, around NPS, do you think this is going to harm the overall cause? Because like you said, maybe if the RBI was lax, will it put, uh, a, uh, will court activism put it on the back foot, sir? See, there's nothing wrong with a public debate. But I don't think the court is the forum to debate uh, why NPA is mounted and what is the solution to NPAs. I don't think the adversarial system where two sides or more than two sides present their cases and a decision is rendered by the court is the system to deal with policy issues and administrative issues. Uh, an NPA issue is not amenable to a judicial decision. An NPA issue is amenable to administrative and regulatory decisions. The RBI is the regulator. The government is the administrator. The, I think the court must trust and leave it to the RBI and the government to tackle the NPA issue. This is not the first time we've had an NPA issue. We had NPA issues earlier also, but we did, we did tackle them. In fact, until... Uh, 2008, the NPA situation was well under control. Nobody spoke about the NPA problem as you are speaking today. The deterioration occurred during the period of the global recession and when India responded in textbook fashion by increasing spending uh, and encouraged people uh, to invest. So I think uh, it is in a sense uh, intended or unintended a consequence of a response to a global recession. You didn't comment about uh, the laxity bit uh, regarding the RBI that you just said, sir. No. I said earlier, perhaps the, regul the oversight was more lax than it should have been. But that's not something on which you can make a pronouncement. You'll have to look at it uh, okay. uh, case by case or bank by bank to see whether there was any laxity in the regulation of the bank or the banks. 
I understand that. One last bit, really, and this is uh, with regard to GST. Again, you, you spoke about uh, reforms and legislation. You were the first one, Mr. Chidamram, I rem remember reading um, on, a, on a Sunday or a Saturday your article on GST uh, in the Express, where you uh, delineated the position for the first time. Nobody from the Congress, in fact, had spoken about that matter, and that's where it started building up from. From then to now, has anything given, sir, because everyone seems to be putting a lot of stress on, on getting GST through the budget session. If I may ask you, has that environment been created? My position in GST has not changed. If anything, it has evolved based on the discussions in the Empowered Committee and based on feedback that we get from the stakeholders. So when I wrote that article, I believe I reflected the view of the Congress Party. If the Congress Party has endorsed the position taken in that article, I'm happy. But the negotiations are between the Congress Party's parliamentary leadership and the government. I know that the Congress Party has given its objections in writing uh, to the government. But I also know that the Congress Party has not received any written response from the government. Unless there is a written response, how does the Congress party know whether the objections have been accepted and whether the changes suggested will be accommodated in the pending bill? So I think in a bit, uh, bit of a standoff, uh, unless the government is willing to communicate with the Congress party, I'm afraid the standoff will continue for a few more days or a few more weeks. The best course is for government to say, all right, we accept this, this is our formulation or revised formulation. We don't accept this. We are sticking to our original formulation. And then let the Congress party take its final call. Well, maybe the budget would, would, uh, would be the uh, opportunity for Mr. Jaitley and the government to come out and clarify its stance on those issues. Thank you very much, Mr. Chidambaram, for making out time uh, Thank uh, you. to talk about the economy. And once again, congratulations for your book. Thank you. Thank you.